Welcome to this week's Money Meadows podcast, helping gold and silver investors during these turbulent times. Now, here's this week's market wrap with commentary and analysis from the low-cost precious metals dealer voted best in the U.S., Money Meadows Exchange. Welcome to this week's Market Wrap podcast. I'm Mike Gleason. Coming up, we'll hear part one of an interview Money Metals President Stefan Gleason gave with Palisades Gold Radio. Stefan talks about sound money and the big inflation scam being run by the Federal Reserve. Plus, he provides a detailed inside look at legislative efforts underway at the state level to reaffirm gold and silver as money, remove taxation, and protect investors. So stick around for this eye-opening interview coming up after this week's market update. As President Joe Biden pushed massive new spending initiatives in his address before Congress, investors shrugged off rising inflation risk. They pushed the S&P 500 up to a new record close on Thursday. Gold, meanwhile, continues to be capped under the $1,800 level, at least for the time being. As of this Friday recording, gold prices check in at $1,778 an ounce after falling a slight 0.3% since last Friday's close. Silver shows a slight weekly gain of 0.2% to trade at $26.24 per ounce. Platinum is down 1.4% for the week to come in at $1,233. And finally, palladium continues to be the pace setter in the metal space, adding another 4.5% this week to hit a new record and bring prices to $3,021 an ounce. As trading closes out the month of April, precious metals bulls will be hoping for a more fruitful May. Although May is typically a quiet month in markets, not known for producing major crashes or price spikes, it can represent a seasonal turning point. The old adage, sell in May and go away, is premised on the stock market entering a seasonally weak period that typically lasts through October. Last year was a very abnormal year, of course, and this one looks to be atypical as well. With all the fiscal and monetary stimulus still making its way through the economy, seasonal trends in markets could be moot. A major breakout in gold and silver prices could occur at any time. A short squeeze in the futures market remains a viable scenario given the still ongoing disconnect between tremendously strong demand for physical bullion and paper selling of futures contracts. Some online silver investing communities are eyeing May 1st for a massive new buying campaign. How much buying actually materializes remains to be seen, but with mints struggling to keep up with demand and dealer inventories for popular products, including silver eagles, silver bars, and silver rounds already stretched thin, another buying surge could have an effect on premiums and availability. Those who don't have a particular desire to own American Eagles can still get much better pricing on silver rounds that contain the same .999 purity. We have beautiful designs to choose from at Money Metals Exchange, including the Buffalo and the classic Walking Liberty in the form of privately minted rounds. Even better pricing is available for Vault Silver, our storage program for customers who don't want to take physical possession of silver products but still want to directly own the physical metal in their own storage account. Silver and gold markets are waiting their turn to ride the inflationary wave that has hit so many other markets this year. Palladium and copper prices are soaring to new heights. The housing market is rising at one of the fastest clips on record as lumber prices go through the roof. Technology companies are grappling with a computer chip shortage. Retailers are struggling with a labor shortage as millions of working age Americans stay home and collect government benefits. Just about everywhere you look in the economy, supply chains are strained. The precious metals bullion marketplace is a case in point. The fact that spot prices haven't responded in kind over the past several months is a source of frustration for many gold and silver bugs, but it's also a value opportunity. Those who can see what's coming know that the value of the Federal Reserve note will continue to decline. They know that at some point, the richly valued stock market will correct, pushing mainstream investors to seek alternatives, and they won't be able to keep up with inflation by sitting in cash. The tsunami of deficit spending and currency creation out of Washington will only increase going forward. President Biden just proposed trillions in new spending for what he euphemistically calls jobs and infrastructure. In reality, this spending represents the entire remaking of the U.S. economy. Biden's far-reaching agenda is leading some to compare him to Franklin Delano Roosevelt. FDR is commonly believed to have pulled the country out of an economic crisis through a range of government programs that fell under the banner of the New Deal. What's less commonly understood about FDR is that he radically expanded the power of the government to control and destroy wealth. 
He threatened to pack the Supreme Court until it finally capitulated and stopped striking down his power grabs as unconstitutional. Now, Joe Biden is forming a commission to look into packing the Supreme Court with additional justices that would be more favorable to his agenda. Back on May 1st, 1933, FDR issued Executive Order 6102, making it illegal for members of the general public to own more than five ounces of gold bullion. Back then, the dollar's value was pegged to gold. The government's way of creating inflation was to raise the price of gold in terms of dollars and make sure as few people as possible were protected from the devaluation. Under our current fiat monetary regime, the Biden administration need not bother with gold prohibition. It can spend and borrow at the will of the Congress and get the Federal Reserve to produce all the monetary stimulus it desires. Just like during the days of the classical gold standard, a currency devaluation will ultimately be reflected in the dollar price of gold and silver as well. The devaluation won't be formally announced, but when the precious metals are trading at record highs again, it will be obvious to anyone who is paying attention that sound money serves as protection against the government's steady confiscation of purchasing power. Well now, without further delay, let's get right to part one of Stefan's recent interview with Palisades Gold Radio. We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that we really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovix. Joining me today is Stefan Gleason, president of Money Metals Exchange and also a director of the Sound Money Defense League. How are you today, Stefan? Hi, Tom. Thank you for having me on. I always enjoy your shows. When I go out running, I always have it on my iPod. I've been the listener for a long time. That's awesome. I, I appreciate the uh, the support. And I want to congratulate you on uh, winning Bullion Dealer of the Year by Investorpedia. Thank you. It kind of came out of the blue. Uh, we didn't know they were doing that. They said we were the best overall dealer in the United States. And I think that the reason that they gave us that was because of not just our pricing and our service, but the array of services that we have that many of our competitors don't. We have a fully integrated depository. We have a program to lend against precious metals. If somebody wants a line of credit against their own gold uh, in our depository, they can actually do that for business purposes. Our sound money project, which we're going to talk about today, some of those things I think kind of helped, but we don't take that for granted. There's a lot of good dealers out there. Yeah, that absolutely makes sense, Stefan. So of course, you're the president of a bullion dealer, and there's a lot there we can dig into. But as you said, we're going to dig into a bit more about the discussion around sound money related public policy. So why don't we start by defining what sound right. money is to you and, and how you define that? It, the idea of sound money is stable money, money that holds its value over time, as opposed to political money or fiat money, which is based on not just nothing tangible, but is really at the whims of the political leaders of the central bankers. And so as a result, you have a very unsound money, a money that's volatile and that generally has been depreciating. But the idea of sound money is storing purchasing power over time, not having huge amounts of variation in, in the purchasing power over time. And, and gold and silver have essentially been chosen by the market over the last 4,000 years as the money that sustains and preserves purchasing power. And so that's probably the greatest example of sound money, but there are other things that could be sound money theoretically. So the idea of sound money is really the opposite of what we have today, which is political money, fiat money, and government control, economic policy through government central planning, where the currency is one of the main tools used to control the economy or plan the economy. And that's Keynesian economics as opposed to the Austrian school or the hard money or the, sort of the sound money oriented economic thinkers who have been, basically been completely uh, run out of the academia. That school of thought has been essentially eliminated from a legitimate discussion over the last 100 years or 75 years since the New Deal. It's starting to come back. Many of these people are prominent thinkers and are becoming more prominent. But the general mainstream is Keynesian economics, and that's very 
contrary to the principles of sound money. Excellent. So you have a sound money index on your site that ranks all 50 U.S. states' monetary policies. So what does this index try and help illustrate? We've been focused on public policy for at least the last five or six years as one of the areas that we think we can do some good for the industry and for our customers and for the country. And of course, the main problem originates with federal policy, federal reserve system, removal of gold and silver from the monetary system. And of course, the most recent and the the most significant event was the removal of the last link to gold in the early 70s, which led to an explosion in government debt. There was no longer any tether or any restriction on the issuance of new currency units after we violated and broke the Bretton Woods Treaty temporarily, I think was how it was framed at the time. (laughs) Uh, So if you look at what happened with government since then and government debt, it's like a hockey stick. The debt expanded dramatically and government expanded dramatically since the early 70s. So anyway, I just want to start by pointing out that the main problem is federal policy. We have some legislation addressing a couple of the areas there, but there's, of course, huge problems, the Federal Reserve System itself, and so on. But there are some things that states can do. And we've found that at the state level, there's a greater possibility of affecting positive change on the public policy front. And while we are still involved in federal policies, really the successes that we've had in the last few years have been at the state level in certain states. Obviously, there's an opportunity to create competition between states. Some states are more left-wing sort of oriented than others. That does affect their policies on lots of things. It affects their tax levels. It affects their the freedom of their citizens. And not surprisingly, those states are lower, generally lower on the index when it comes to sound money. But we basically just looked at all the things that a state can do, uh, either is doing or could do, that would reaffirm the role of gold and silver as money, remove taxation from it when you buy and when you sell, other areas of public policy, such as whether the state has a state charter depository for precious metals, whether the state owns gold as an investment, say in the pension funds, whether a state has laws that harass dealers or even private investors who seek to buy or sell gold. And we can talk about a couple crazy things that states do on that front. And we also looked at a couple things like whether a state owns gold in the pension fund, whether it has it as a reserve asset, whether the state owns gold bonds, whether the state issues a gold bond. None of them do either of those things, by the way, yet. But that's a topic I think you had Keith Weiner on at one point. He's pushing that issue and making some progress. But about 55% of the overall index scoring is centered around whether the state has sales tax when you buy precious metals or income tax on gains if you sell precious metals. And so that's probably the major issue from remarkable differences between the states, though, on just those two. So, Stefan, explain to us why a sales tax on precious metals is a silly idea and maybe use the example of breaking that $5 bill that you use in that index. When you're acquiring precious metals, you are simply exchanging one form of money. I wouldn't necessarily call it money, but we're told that it's money for another when you're buying a gold bar, for example, or a silver coin. And so you're just breaking the dollar into some other denomination of money. And in fact, in better money, many states consider that to be a taxable event. They consider that to be something where you have to pay a sales tax of five to 10% on that. So that would be like going into a grocery store and saying, I want four quarters for this dollar. And they said, okay, great. You know, we need a dollar seven before we give you the four quarters. And so it's kind of a silly idea. Fortunately, many states have recognized it's silly to be taxing money, that this is money. And if it's not money, it's an investment. Some of them don't necessarily say it's money, but they are willing to acknowledge that this is an investment. And what other type of investment Do you have to pay a sales tax on? So the idea of a sales tax is a consumption tax. It's the idea that you're the final user of this perishable good that the last user pays the sales tax on the wholesale level. Business buys it from the wholesaler and then sells it and it gets distributed. There's no tax, but then the final consumer pays the sales tax. So that whole concept is totally invalid when it comes to gold and silver. Gold and silver is held inherently for resale, or if you're going to look at it as an investment, it's held for resale. It's not eaten. Well, I guess colloidal silver, you can drink colloidal silver. So <laughs> in that case, it's consumed. But gold coins, gold bars, these are not being consumed. They're not artwork. They are stored purchasing power. 
their money and their investment, and they're going to be sold again. And so the idea of charging a sales tax on that transaction is, is ridiculous. 11 states out of 50 and the District of Columbia will tax that 100% in all situations, whether gold, silver, platinum, or palladium, they'll have a sales tax. And there's about 10 states that have a sales tax on certain types of transactions involving precious metals. And then there are roughly about 30 states that 28, I think, that have no tax at all. Five of them don't have a sales tax for anything. And then the rest of them specifically have a law, some of which we have helped pass in recent years, but many are recent, 20, uh, 22, 23 states that specifically have passed a law that specifically exempts all gold and silver, platinum and palladium, coins, bars and rounds from sales tax. There's about 11 really bad states on that topic. Uh, we have bills today still live in this current legislative session in four of them. We had one in Mississippi that unfortunately didn't even get a hearing, but we still have a sales tax repeal in Maine, New Jersey, Tennessee, and Arkansas, and Minnesota. So there's actually five where we still, even this session, have a chance of expanding that list of states that exempt precious metals from the sales tax. That's one area that the Sound Money Defense League has been focusing on is promoting these repeals of sales tax on precious metals. And then at the same time, defending against repeal attempts. Let me back up. So we have states where we're trying to expand the exemption. And then there are states where the other side has been trying to roll back those exemptions in some cases, outright repeal them. And so we've had some, some serious battles in, for example, Washington state on at least two, the last two years, they have attempted to eliminate the exemption for sales tax on precious metals. And we stopped them. And that was a, actually a pretty big battle. We had a lot of grassroots people involved in that. On the other hand, we did lose Ohio. So Ohio, as of two years ago, did not have a sales tax on precious metals, and it does now. They repealed it. There's all kinds of reasons why these things happen. That's a, a Republican legislature, too, which is even more disappointing. I think part of the problem there was that there was a big scandal about 20 years ago in our industry, and they tried to tie the sales tax exemption that existed to that old scandal involving a local dealer in the state that the state got into some big scheme with and blew up. They called it the exemption. I can't remember the guy's name, but they put his name on the exemption and said, let's repeal the so-and-so -so exemption. They were able to do it and we weren't able to stop them. But there is interest in reinstituting that exemption. So we have friends in that legislature that are looking at reintroducing a bill to fix that. Excellent. So Stefan, how does this concept also go against taxpayers when holding metals and then having to report a capital gain when it was likely just a phantom gain that resulted from the depreciation of the value of the currency right. that it's measured against? Yeah, so this is the big scam of inflation. That's why inflation is a tax because, I mean, not only are you losing purchasing power, but when you end up with capital assets that appreciate in value according to the currency that they're being measured in, you end up getting taxed on that as though you had a gain. But in many cases, it's not a real gain at all. It's a gain simply, it's a nominal gain that results only from the devaluation of the Federal Reserve note. The IRS says you had a gain and you have to pay even more of your assets to them. That's the injustice. One of the great injustices of our inflationary system is that it slowly whittles away at people's assets and then it taxes them in the process. The problem usually begins with the federal level again, because the IRS currently has the position that gold and silver is a collectible gold bullion, even a non-rare coin, just a, a gold eagle or a gold bar. It's a collectible. And as a collectible, and this is without statutory backing, this position, but as a collectible, it would be taxed at a higher 28% long-term capital gains tax rate federally, whereas a piece of real estate or bond or stock only gets taxed at 15% or 20% if your income's over a certain level. So gold and silver is already taxed at a discriminatorily high 28% long-term capital gains tax rate. Now, of course, as we just talked about, that gain isn't necessarily a real gain, but they call it a gain and you pay 28%. Then the states will typically follow your federal income number. So you, you do your federal taxes, and then the states piggyback on that. And so if you had a gain, if you had income federally, then the state starts with that number and says, okay, here's your state income. And then they do their 
adjustments, and then they charge you their tax. So if we could get Congressman Mooney's bill passed, which is called the Monetary Metals Tax Neutrality Act, then it would remove gold and silver completely from federal income and thus remove the income tax from gold and silver. And then states wouldn't have that income included in the number they start calculating your state tax on. That would be step one. One way of attacking this would be to pass Congressman Mooney's bill be reintroduced about two weeks ago. Then some states have said, we're going to undo the error happening federally. We're not going to include or allow to be included gold and silver gains as income in state income taxes. Three years ago, we helped the state of Arizona or our allies in Arizona pass a bill that took gold and silver income out of the calculation of state income taxes. So if you had a federal gain, you subtract it at the state level. And that was tax neutral, just like the federal bill. If you had a loss that you deducted federally, then technically you would have had to add it back to your Arizona income. I'm fine with that because first of all, we're saying gold and silver should be a non-entity completely from a tax standpoint. And so we don't necessarily need a one-sided giveaway. But on the other hand, most of the time, because of this inflationary system, there's going to be gains because just by going nowhere, they're going to have a gain when priced in Federal Reserve notes. So taxpayers will more often than not win with that kind of law, even though they might have to subtract, uh, or I should say, add back their losses if they had deducted them federally. Hopefully we don't ever have to really sell our gold or silver for a loss. Unlikely to have to sell for much of a loss in this crazy inflationary environment that we're in, a loss from their standpoint anyway. The law passed in Arizona, we had a, a law in Idaho, we only passed it through one house that uh, so that wasn't enacted that would have removed gold and silver from the income tax. There is a bill in South Carolina right now that would do this. And we did pass such a bill in Wyoming. Actually, we passed in Wyoming with some help of allies in state and campaign for liberty based in state. We were able to pass a law that said there shall be no taxes of any kind on gold and silver, no property tax, no sales tax, no income tax, no taxes. And it also acknowledged and reaffirmed that gold and silver is money at the state level under Article 1, Section 10 of the U.S. Constitution. It says that gold and silver is the money of the states. It actually forbids states from using anything but gold and silver as money in making payments. But that's another fallen by the wayside, but that's still in the Constitution. So Wyoming eliminated all taxes. Sales tax is sort of the main area of battle right now, because especially with the passage of the ruling in 2018 of Wayfair versus South Dakota, which essentially imposed sales tax on internet transactions across state lines. So now this is something that everyone is having to contend with. Every online dealer, wherever you buy gold and silver, if you're in a jurisdiction that has sales tax, then you're going to be charged sales tax. And so it's become an even more important issue. But income tax is sort of a a tier two issue that we're focused on a few others down the way from there. So Stefan, are there any possibilities, let's say, for somebody to go next door to a state that has more favorable, uh, let's say, tax regime around gold and silver, and then bringing it back across state lines? Are, Are there any examples of that that you know that are, let's say, you don't have to declare necessarily, or um, do you have to declare all of those? Okay. So there's sales and use tax. So sales tax, it's the same thing essentially, but if a state has a sales tax, they expect individuals to pay a use tax if the person from whom they bought the good didn't charge a sales tax. So there's actually a place on state income tax returns to say, here are the use taxes that I owe because I didn't I didn't pay sales taxes. Now that's something tax bureaucrats recognize that most individual taxpayers aren't going to report that. And frankly, most of them aren't even know they have to report that. Not everyone is a CPA and keeps every receipt and looks and sees they were charged this tax. Oh, I owe the tax. Oh, you know, they probably have no idea that gold and silver could be taxed in their state. The way that sales tax is determined is based on the delivery state. For example, my company, Money Metals Exchange, has a depository in Idaho. So in Idaho, and there's no sales tax in Idaho. So if somebody is in a state where if we were to ship to them their purchase, we would have to collect and remit sales taxes to their government in their state. They could choose to store it in the depository in Idaho. 
and it would be lawfully exempt from tax because it was delivered into Idaho and there's no sales tax on precious metals in Idaho. One thing that has happened in the states that are surrounded by jurisdictions that have no sales tax and they're an island that does, people cross state lines and they go and purchase from a local dealer in the neighboring state and they bring it back. And that's happening. And it does not have to be collected by the seller. They're showing up on his doorstep in a state where there's no sales tax. But what's happened, honestly, in these states that have sales taxes, and particularly now, because there's 39 states that have either some or no sales taxes on precious metals, what's happened is the dealers in those states have gone out of business. There are a lot fewer big coin shows in those states as well. And so one of the arguments that we point out to these legislatures is that you're losing economic activity that is actually probably reducing your overall revenues tax revenues, you're losing out because there's not going to be as many conventions in your state. And people are going to go to another state and purchase their precious metals, and your local businesses are going to go out of business. And that's been the case. In fact, in Louisiana, a few years ago, they briefly repealed the sales tax exemption on precious metals. And very quickly, some businesses started having big problems. They lost conventions in New Orleans and so forth, and they quickly repealed it and said, we made a big mistake. We cost ourselves way more than we were thought we were getting. When you're talking about 5 to 10% being added to the price of precious metals, it's a big incentive for somebody to figure out a way to store precious metals in a state that doesn't tax or acquire them from a state that doesn't tax and take them back to their state. We certainly see a lot more, even more interest in our depository than ever because of this developing sales tax situation. And as I mentioned in Idaho, like many states, there is no sales tax. And so it gets stored in the depository, no tax. Yeah, it sounds like there's a lot of intricacies around how all of this works. And that resource on your website is excellent. And I encourage everybody to go look at it. We'll absolutely link to it in the show notes there as well, Stefan. What does having a state gold and silver bullion depository achieve? There's one state that has such a system, and it's Texas. And this made the news five or 10 years ago. They created a state depository system. They had independent or private contractors all bid on being state chartered depository. And so it's under the auspices of the state controller. So it's indirectly a part of the state's regime, if you will. And and it's not state run, but it's state overseen, I guess is probably the way. So, I mean, obviously that's a tricky issue. On one hand, I think there's benefits. On the other hand, I'm a private business owner, and I don't necessarily want to be competing against a government-supported depository. But the theory on why that's a good idea is that there may be greater protection for such a depository, one that's under the state police powers of the state financial system directly or even somewhat indirectly in the case of a federal aggression, because states have the preeminent position states themselves in being a protection, if you will, against a federal confiscation or something like that. So theoretically, a state-run depository would be in a better posture if the Fed said all gold has to be turned into the federal government. Regulation in Idaho, we are under a regulatory regime with the State Department of Finance, and, and I think many depositories in their states have some level of regulation. But I don't necessarily think government intertwining with my business would be a good thing. And so I'm not really eager to be a state depository, so to speak. But it is a policy that we have on the index because we think that there is some merit to the idea. Now, one thing that's interesting in Texas, part of the reason that that whole thing was started is because Texas is one of the few states that has a very significant holding of gold bullion. And so part of the rationale for a state depository system was, why do we want to store this bullion that the state owns for the teacher pension fund? And they have like a billion dollars worth of gold, the Texas Teacher Pension Retirement Fund, but it was in the hands of Wall Street. And they were paying storage fees, of course, which may be less if it was inside of a state charter depository. So I think that's what got the ball rolling in Texas was, hey, we got a billion dollars worth of gold. That represents a few million dollars a year in storage fees. We're not real thrilled with the idea. And so To their credit, the people that involved in the pension fund who brought this up and and others in the state said, hey, we don't necessarily want Texas's government-owned gold, which is supposed to help secure the pensions of our teachers. 
to be in the hands of Wall Street bankers and bullion banks, which may have rehypothecated it or done something. And besides, it's costing a lot of money to store it there. We could create jobs here in Texas and store it in Texas. And so that's what started that. So in Tennessee right now, it's likely to pass. It's already passed one of the chambers, the Senate. There's a hearing Wednesday, the 14th. There's a hearing in the House committee in Tennessee on a bill that would commission a task force to research having a Tennessee bullion depository. It's a valid idea, and it's one of the things that we rank in the index. I hope you enjoyed the first part of that interview, and we'll play the conclusion of this recent appearance by Money Metals President Stefan Gleason in one of our upcoming podcasts. Well, that will do it for this week. Be sure to check back next Friday for our next weekly Market Wrap podcast. Until then, this has been Mike Gleason with Money Metals Exchange. Thanks for listening, and have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this week's Money Metals podcast. Be sure to come back next week. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast through iTunes for answers to all of your questions or to discreetly and securely buy or sell gold or silver coins, bars, and rounds. Call 1-800-800-1865 or visit www.moneymetals.com. Our knowledgeable and no-pressure specialists are standing by between 7 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. Mountain Time, Monday through Friday. Or you can lock in your order online, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Again, visit us at www.moneymetals.com or call 1-800-800-1865.